the Bible. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word, a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. His words will I hide in my heart that I may not sin against God. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for which he stands, one brotherhood, uniting all Christians in service and in love.
this leg and they removed it. She was a sight of a softball that had wrapped around the bone. Uh, it was not malignant, and they were able to take it out in pieces with uh, minimal nerve damage. But I'm just thankful that, that it all went well. Thank you. Will you pray this, Shirley? Um, Tuesday, Dan and I went to um, the elementary school with Lydia and Brody for Grandparents Day or VIP Day or whatever it is. Of course, they had cookies and, and we got to see where their classes were and all that kind of stuff. But we ran into Norma there. Uh, Norma was there with one of the great grandkids. Um, and so I uh, visited with her a little bit and she said to tell everybody hi. And um, she looked really good and says she's still having a lot of pain in her back and her legs, but uh, um, she looked really good and it was good to see her smile. So that was a, that was a praise. She said to say hi to everybody. So she was crazy and prayer concerns. Roger. Sue and I had a, uh, I guess you could say an event happen late yesterday after yesterday afternoon in our lives and that of our family that we feel we need to ask for your prayers for. As some of you may know, our son, 20 the oldest boy, is involved in a uh, very drawn out divorce uh, because of uh, abusive behavior by his wife of two years. And it has now escalated yesterday to the point where we fear for his life from her actions. And uh, the brothers and sisters have gathered around from all over the country and they have taken very definite action uh, last night. Uh, and so we're kind of on needles and pins today to uh, see how this plays out. But just for our son's uh, safety uh, there and wisdom, uh, please, for the rest of us, the rest of the family, to be able to do something for our sons. Just ask that the uh, prayer for the association meeting this afternoon uh, over new problems.
Bible Museum. So thank you for allowing me to share this with you. That would be my pleasure. there's not any better time for us to be reminded that in the midst of the turmoil and in the midst of the things that are going on in our world, and especially, you know, things in our politics, we all, we all yearn that, um, you know, from time to time that uh, uh, things would turn out for our political parties. Uh, that's what elections are about. But today, the psalmist tells us, don't put your trust in them. Put your trust in God. That we come today to proclaim not loyalty to any one political party, any one um, uh, uh, nation, any one uh, uh, whatever entity we might be tempted to proclaim loyalty to. We come to just simply say, we are the people of God. And we call upon him for our strength and our purpose. Um, I spoke with First Baptist this morning and just said, and you know, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Paul often spoke those words in times of trouble in his own life. And it reminds us that things don't need to be going well for us to put our trust in the Lord. We may not know the answer. We may have skepticism. We may be in a place where maybe we're doubting, and that's okay. Trust in the Lord is what this walk is about. And so, um, not to put our trust in princes, not to put our trust in the horses or the militaries of the world, but to put our faith in the one who created us, is molding us, and as Paul would say in Philippians chapter 4, that the Lord is drawing near to us, that he is with us. So we make that proclamation, and we also try to push in and live into that truth. Because it's hard. It's hard as people. But uh, uh, the Lord offers himself to be known and to draw near. Let's give ourselves a moment of silence, and I'll close this in just a few moments. Uh, maybe there's something on your heart that you'd like. You didn't feel vulnerable to say this morning, but this would be the opportunity. Just look at and also remember the things that are laid out. Let's pray.
was drawn near to us. So near that you lived among us seven years ago. Lord, we pray that you might draw near to us today. That you would send forth your spirit to be your presence in our lives. That we may know that you are working, that you are molding and you are making us into the people that we desire to be. People that are defined by your mercy, your grace, your truth, and your love. That live in a world where we, we, even we, who confess you as our Lord and our Creator, struggle, are filled with hurt, are filled with questions sometimes for the things that are going on in our lives and in the world around us. Lord, draw near to our world. Draw near to the places of war, Draw near to the places where people are facing starvation today. Lord, draw near to the places of abuse and violence. And deliver us from ourselves. We'd like to stand before you today and say we do not trust in princes and militaries things of this world, but Lord, they are alluring. They do have a way of drawing us in. So Lord, I pray that you would intervene and draw us closer to you. That as we surrender our lives in, a, in their good points, in the successes, we also give to you those parts that are utterly broken, shattered, lying in pieces, <clears throat> places where we stumble and we sin. Lord, I pray that you would take them today and that you would redeem us because you choose to forgive us by your mercy and grace. Lord, I pray once again that you would draw near to those in our community that are struggling, that are hurting, that have yet to connect to you. Lord, I ask that your spirit would go forth into their lives, that they may see you clearly, and that they might wrestle with you as Jacob did. And they might say, I have wrestled with the Lord, and I have seen his face, and I will praise his name. Lord, do that because we have been faithful to be a blessing to those around us. Lord, you've heard the hearts of your people today. I pray that all of those situations, as fragile as they may be, as painful as they are, that those pieces would be redeemed and lifted up today. So that your grace and your mercy and your truth might be seen in those places. That we too would be like those that were healed by the hand of Jesus. And say, glory be to God the Father that has drawn near to us. Lord, make us your people today. Or we surrender our lives for you to be our God. We ask that you would direct us and guide us. For we give our lives to be your sheep. We give our lives to be shepherd by you. Lord, lift us up today as your people. And may our trust be in you alone. In your precious and holy name we pray and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.
And we pause to give thanks through the giving of our gifts, our offerings, our time, that we may say thank you, Lord, for blessing me in these ways. And we bless the Lord in return. Let us stand and sing the words of the doxology. <laughs>
a bit of a cautionary tale today from the words of Luke about a rich man and a man named Lazarus who was a beggar at the rich man's door. So as we hear today, let us hear with ears to hear because sometimes these cautionary tales or these parables they're meant to really challenge our perceptions of what we think are important in the world. And Jesus came in and he, he almost turns that around. He turns it on its head. And so often in Luke, what we find Luke doing is writing about the lives of vulnerable people. People that are often taken advantage of, people that are in situations where um, their, their choices are limited. And we don't like to admit it, but we live in a world where um, we like to believe that everybody has the same choices. But so often there are people in our world that actually, their, their choices are narrowed down for them. To the point sometimes where it almost seems like you either do this, or you do this. There's really only a couple of options. And sometimes it may even seem like, no, you don't have a choice. You're just going to be told. And this is the world that those two worlds collide in. A man whose life was clinging to the blessing of another man who had a lot of choices. Someone who had a lot of resources. <clears throat> and so Jesus uses this parable, this teaching, to talk to his disciples, and more importantly, to talk to the Pharisees and the scribes that were hearing Jesus talk, to warn them. But Jesus always has a purpose, and that is much of the purpose of prophets, which was to get people to turn around and return to their faith, to the God that created them. Jesus says that there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and he lived in luxury every day. And at his, at his gate, sitting on a bench, was laid a beggar, whose name was Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side, and the rich man also died and was buried. Now in hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and he saw Abraham far away, with Lazarus by his side. And so he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. And Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things, but now he's comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot. Nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, that I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. It says he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. 
May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word this morning from the Gospel of Luke. Again, a story of somebody who has plenty. And a man who's named Lazarus, who is sitting on a bench day after day, moment after moment, waiting for a morsel, scraps, from, the, from this man's table, so that he may have a bite, he may be sustained. I really think this story is a story about a lost soul. Just a few chapters back, if you read in Luke, you'll find that it contains three parables. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son. And Jesus, I think, continues that line of thinking here when he talks about the rich man. And I find it interesting in this passage, I don't know if you've ever noticed it before, but a man who has everything in the world, a man who has the power to make many decisions, the man who has the power to bless Lazarus or not with just scraps from his table. He doesn't have a name. Luke doesn't name him. Luke only identifies him as a rich man who wore purple and fine linen and was in luxury every day. A rich man defined by the things of this world. But interestingly enough, the man who had nothing, the man who literally, the scriptures say, he wore sores. He didn't wear fine linens. He wore sores on his body. A man who was sick, a man who was ill, a man who had been outcast, a man who had put and pushed to the side enough that all he has left to sustain himself this is a beggar, dependent upon this wealthy man. That he may receive enough food, potentially to allow his body to go through the healing process, to be able to ease the pain of the sores on his body. It's interesting enough that Luke, through Jesus, gives him a name. A man who has nothing in this world is given an identity in the story. And a man who has everything he could think of, everything he needed, everything at his disposal is only defined by this thing. This story really goes back, I think, to the one who ate, um, the rich man calls upon as he sees Lazarus by Abraham's son. I think this story takes us all the way back to when Abraham himself was called. And this conversation undergirding is Abraham challenging the rich man who is on the other side of the chasm, a chasm that is not penetrable. You chose your way in life, you were blessed in the world, and now here's where you'll be. Because you lost one thing. You forgot the number of one thing. That Abraham was reminding him that my prosperity did not come because I had things of this world. My prosperity came because the Lord of all creation the Lord who is molding and making us today chose to bless me in order that what? That I might bless others. In other words, this rich man had become a horse, a consumer, at the cost of other people's lives. And in his conversation with Abraham, Abraham, send Lazarus over to have pity on him. 
Let him dip just his fingers, the tip of his finger, and have him come and put it on my tongue, that I may have a moment of joy and celebration from my agony that I feel. And Abraham says, as if he questions him, <coughs> why is it that you chose not to do what my, our father asked? Why is it that when you were blessed by the things of the world, you did not bless those around you who had no capability of receiving even scraps of food? Now we can assume that in Jesus' telling, in Luke's telling of this, that he's probably looking directly at the Pharisees and Sadducees. He's looking at the teachers of the law who are pursuing him relentlessly. To try to get them to turn around and to say, why is it that you have chosen to use your tradition to not only rest upon for your salvation, but to stop blessing the world in your prosperity, and yet you forget the world around you? Why is it? And Jesus shows them a glimpse of what happened. To those that do not get the heart of what God wants for those that he calls and who responds to him. The call that it doesn't matter how much you have in the world. Whatever you have been given, you are called to bless others around you. But that's hard to do in a world that measures success by the amount of wealth you have. It's hard to do when you have friends that are measuring you by how many dollars you give out. But the measure of blessing is comparable to the way you have been blessed in the kingdom of God. So if you've been given much, what does it say? Much is required. To those who are given little, less is required. And yet we sing that song, I Surrender All. And yet we live sometimes opposite of that widow who gave the very last thing in her purse. Because so often we fall into the temptation of success. And we forget that what we're called to be is a blessing. And Jesus says, through the words of Luke, as he's telling the story, Oh, the chasm that is created makes it nearly impossible for others to cross over. He said this in another way, in another place. And he says, oh, how difficult it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because they can't let go of the things they were blessed with. And they lose the mission of blessing others around. In First Baptist report, without any prompting at the end of my sermon, somebody had said, Isn't it interesting that the very thing we're supposed to do is to look at people in the world and to give them a name? And yet it's the thing we so often struggle to do. To give them an identity, not by the things of the world, but because God loves them. And God wants to bless them. How often we fail to give people names.
Oh, that we would be in the business of naming others. As Jesus said. As Abraham. To give them value and dignity in a world where they are mistreated, where they are forgotten, where they don't have anything. We are called to be people who go out and bless others by giving them an identity. And that identity comes through Jesus. I find something else interesting as I close here in this passage. In verse 31, it's, there's this conversation between Abraham and this rich man. And then all of a sudden, in verse 31, it says, he said to him, <coughs> there's some question, who is it that said something to him? What if it was Jesus that stepped in and said, in the midst of this conversation, if they don't look, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets which my father gave them, how is it that they will be convinced when I am raised from the dead? Jesus, I, I almost think that Jesus is saying, even my resurrection is not going to convince them. <clears throat> the only thing that will convince them is a changed heart, which is given by my father. All of us know people in our lives that we sit there and go, I, I don't know. I don't know what it will take for them to, to hear. And I think we're being reminded to say, what if God's asking us to say, in the midst of us not knowing, what if my job is to continually name give them a Give them an identity. It says, I realize you don't know now, but Jesus loves you. So that they don't get to this point where they put all of their hope in the princes of the world. And then there's nothing. As the scriptures say, notice that it says that Lazarus went into the side of the bosom of Abraham. And that the rich man was simply buried. He was put in the ground. And we hear the call to be those people that say, we don't want anybody to just be put in the ground. We really want them to be put in the bosom of Jesus. It's a call today. Not that we would surrender some, but we would surrender all. And to say, Lord, use us to give an identity to our community. The world calls them no creed, but we call them by the name. Gracious and merciful Father, Forgive us when we do not bless others. Forgive us when we forget our mission to give people an identity, a calling in this life because you gave us an identity and a calling. Forgive us when we trust in our own resources and say, Lord, if you but give us a little bit more, we'll give more to you. Lord, today, may we choose to bless you because you have given to us. And because 
we too, like Lazarus, have been given a name because of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to remain the world in your name. In all these things we pray. And God, all God's people say. Amen. Amen. The closing hymn today is I have decided to follow Jesus. I encourage you to follow along in the hymnal in, on page 602. But may that not just be a song we sing, may it be our prayer and our proclamation that today there is no turning back, there is no turning back.